Good morning, everybody. I hope you all are awake. I hope you made it here safely. I, I think all of us are glad to be here. I was wondering if I was going to get here last night with all of the issues with uh, the landing at the airport, but I'm very happy to be here today and to talk to you uh, about some of our thoughts um, about flex testing. Uh, so why flexible testing uh, using the Veraging system? First off, let me tell you a little bit where I'm from. Um, some of you have probably heard about um, Cedar sinai Medical Center. Most people think of it as where the, the Hollywood stars go to die. And, um, but uh, we do a little bit more than that. I hope we do more than that. Um, I've been at Cedars, uh, I don't know, since I was born, like 30 years ago or more. Um, and it was a community hospital when I first arrived there. And I didn't know really what the future of Cedars would be. But it's changed over my 30 years, just as microbiology has changed. It, um, and now we're at Cedars, is a 900-bed facility. It's in the um, heart of Los Angeles. Um, it borders West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and West LA. So we're kind of in a unique situation with some various different population groups. We're the largest cardiac transplant center in the United States currently, which I never thought we would be that, but we are, uh, which brings unique um, uh, problems to the microbiology laboratory. We also do a lot of stem cell transplants. We're huge in orthopedic surgery. That seems to be the, the, grow, the growing um, uh, thing at Cedars. Uh, we're buying lots of facilities and getting into orthopedic surgery. At the same time, we have GI. We have a large cancer center. But the one unique thing about Cedars, which may be very different than your medical centers that you represent, is we have a very, very small pediatric population. We're mostly an elderly care, uh, adult population. We also have a large ED, an urgent care, and lots of clinics. And also my microbiology laboratory does outreach for a lot of the surrounding physician's office. So we're kind of a unique, like every medical center is, uh, but um, we are um, have our peculiarities, shall we say. Also, it's almost 90, 95% private practice physicians. We have a very small faculty, which makes it maybe um, a little bit more difficult to control things, if you get the gist of what I'm saying. Um, my, my husband is a private practice infectious disease person. He's very hard to control. So um, I, I understand uh, the situations, OK? Um, microbiology lab at Cedars, we have 55 staff members. 47 are licensed medical technologists. And you could say, whoa, that's a lot of medical technologists on your staff. But remember, I am in the state of California. We have some odd regulatory licensure issues uh, with the performance of tests and the demand for licensed med techs. We do provide 24-7 coverage at my facility. Just as my hospital has changed over the last 30 years, boy, has microbiology ever changed over the last 30 years. When I first started in microbiology, all we did were plates. You know, I, was, I love plates to this day. Uh, I think it's a unique um, talent to be able to read auger plates. Also, the same with cell culture. That's what I was growing up. I didn't even have rapid spin down shell bile cultures when I first started in microbiology. That dates me, I'm sure. Uh, but things have really evolved in microbiology. And for about 15 years, my first 15 years, I think things were really boring. Uh, you know, just kept plates, plates, automated little susceptibility instruments and such, but nothing really changed. And then over the last decade or so, there has been this huge growth in microbiology where um, I think it's really rejuvenated me. Um, it's like a kid in a candy store. I'm having the best time ever. You're, never, you're not going to get rid of me for a while, I think, because it's, it's really just a ex very, very exciting time. We're moving from the auger plates into more and more automation, um, into molecular, into NGS. There's just everything is moving in a different direction than I had envisioned 30 years ago. OK, so with all of this move, there's also been a lot of move in medical care. And I, I doubt if it's any different in your medical center. You're getting a big move toward antimicrobial stewardship. And that's something that microbiology can be very proud of and participate in and maybe make us come more to the forefront of our hospital because we are a major player in antimicrobial stewardship. Of course, we work with molecular instruments to produce rapid ID and resistance test methods 
but we also have to work very hard in getting rapid just culture results, rapid regular susceptibility results, because that also plays a role in antimicrobial stewardship. And that's one of the major quality council goals at my hospital, and microbiology is very happy to be participating in that. Also, one of the things that we're having to do at Cedars, because I do have a population of 95% of um, uh, private practice physicians, is we're getting very, very involved in uh, improving test utilization. For many years, we just kind of let the physicians, excuse me for saying, but kind of run amok with their shotgun ordering patterns and such um, as they were wanting to do. And we're finding that in this day and age with the cost-cutting measures and trying to be more lean and such, that that's not the way we need to move forward. We need to have improved test utilization. So in doing so, the laboratory needs to offer the best testing options to be able to improve test utilization. We need to limit testing to only what the physician is ordering. We need to monitor and limit physician orders with testing algorithms. And we're actually having some automatic stops in the laboratory, particularly for re repeat testing or for testing that we think do not fulfill certain guidelines. And hopefully all of this will improve um, the economic outcome of the laboratory. And also let's not forget about those poor patients that are paying the bills of all of those tests that we're performing. And of course, we're looking for improved patient outcomes with earlier patient discharge. So how can a microbiology laboratory really accomplish all of this, or at least play a role in this? Well, for many years, I, I have a large laboratory, but it's not huge. It's a moderately large laboratory. But a lot of the instruments about a decade or a little bit more ago were these huge mega instruments meant mostly for um, um, reference laboratory type situations. So the instruments were mostly one size fits all, but it wasn't my size. And so for a long time, we weren't able to really um, automate or use molecular testing because the systems were quite large. They were fixed panels with a fixed price. And targets on the panel might have been more than you reasonably need, or certainly more than the physician thought that they needed to order. And also, because even the panels had lots of targets, not always were those the targets that I needed. So along with the um, large panels, I also needed multiple platforms uh, sometimes to fulfill the needs of the physician. Or even worse, sometimes they only wanted one of those targets, not the entire panel of targets. And so we were having to use multiple platforms. One of the big things microbiology labs, at least my laboratory, is trying to do is consolidate platforms. I don't know about you, but lately, training and competency have been driving us crazy in the laboratory. The uh, demand for extensive competency records and such takes a great deal of time. Also, proficiency and QC, all of the new IQCP things that are coming out in the laboratories. The inventory, all of this drives us toward trying to consolidate to a very, very few platforms to try to save money. Also, if we're doing multiple things, multiple tests, huge targets and such, the expense is passed on to the patient. And this is particularly noteworthy if you have an outpatient testing population like we do at Cedars. So what are we doing in microbiology? What's maybe the so-called testing evolution, if you want to call it that? Well, there seems to be a migration to syndrome-based testing panels and possibly away from very, very large targeted multiplex panels. Such as stool panels are being broken up into separate bacteria, that parasitic and viral um, panels. So sepsis panels are possibly broken up into different units to save from testing multiple targets, as you could say that for the respiratory pathogen panels as well. Such as you might have a multi-large panel to fill some physician's needs but very select small panels if you just want to do influenza testing. Also, after we have the syndrome-based and appropriate panels, I don't know about your medical centers, but my medical center says quality first, price second. Pricing has become very, very important in my medical center. And of course, there's competition of products, which is based on pricing. And ultimately, I hate to say, but the use of a lot of laboratory products in my laboratory has been based on price. If we can say that the quality is the same, then they say, okay, what's the pricing? 
And so that has become a very, very, very important thing in my laboratory. And there has been increasing need to try to reduce costs in my lab. There's also increasing need for clinical and financial data to support the creation of new molecular programs. Uh, I never thought I was a business person, and most of you would probably say you're not, and I would probably agree with you, but I have business people in my staff, and I have to actually prepare a business proposal to administration if I want to get a new instrument, and if I want to start a new program for molecular testing. And that new program will include not just the, in, once we get it, say we are successful with our program and we're able to get the instrument, then I have to supply data for years after that, every six months, to show that what we had originally promised has come true. And so there's much more um, financial uh, information that's needed on the laboratory and a much more pressure to be cost efficient. And of course, most of us are moving to FDA kits. It's just a much cleaner proposition for us to use FDA kits. There's no issues with billing and there's no issues with the uh, potential quality of our um, LDT in the laboratory. Diagnostic challenge, the PCR testing for respiratory tract infections. Well, what's our challenge? Well, as we start moving into influenza season, of course, we, we know that the respiratory site is a very, very common site for infection. And we get a lot of specimens from resp respiratory sites to test. Some days we can have 40 or 50 specimens in the laboratory. For some of your labs, that may seem minuscule, but for us, 50 specimens a day is, is a fairly large volume. Also, it can be difficult even in the best of situations for a physician trying to control utilization of respiratory testing uh, to determine etiology and optimal patient management just clearly based on symptoms. So sometimes it does take the laboratory to assist with, of course, doing various laboratory tests to provide a diagnosis. And there's a wide array of respiratory pathogens, and we can't do all of them all of the time because there is seasonal variation. So the challenge is major. We have a lot of specimens coming our way, a lot of pathogens that we need to test for, but not all of them need to be tested at every time of the, you know, every moment of the year. So what drives our ordering patterns in my institution and possibly most institutions is of course seasonal variation. We're not going to do a specific influenza panel in July, um, and so um, it is helpful to have the ability to test seasonal viruses and seasonal organisms. Patient demographics. I think there's a big difference if you deal primarily with the outpatient population these days with the way insurance is versus the inpatient population. And, and that can really drive um, the ordering pattern, whether it is an inpatient or outpatient. Also underlying conditions. We have a huge immune suppressed population at Cedars, and that's certainly an issue. And we have a lack of pediatrics. So we may go in a different direction than you, you and your medical center, particularly if you're a pediatric hospital. So the ordering patterns do make a big difference in what methods that we're using in our laboratory. Also, uh, we're not alone at Cedars anymore. We used to, I think, make more autonomous decisions maybe 20 years ago, because no one really knew we were there. You know, we kind of did things that were sent to us, but that's not the way it is anymore. We're a major part of hospital committees, and there's a hospital committee decisions that are being made for laboratory testing in microbiology, and infection control is a huge, huge issue at Cedars, a very, very important issue, and infection control and infectious disease help us make most of the decisions that are um, happening in our microbiology laboratory. One could say, oh, well, that's not good. You're being dominated by infection control and infectious disease. I would say, no, that's not the way it is. I would say, I, I'm, I'm finally happy that I'm kind of one of a team member. And I think they, they know that we're the people who do the test. So they appreciate us greatly. And also, they help carry the burden of decision. In the old days, when we used to make decisions by ourselves, someone would call me up on the phone and go, why are you doing that? How did you make that decision? Blah, blah, blah. And here we were. We were the ones who made the decision. Now with this hospital committee decision making uh, and many, many people uh, involved in the actual end result of the test being involved in the decision, uh, we all are carrying the responsibility of those decisions. And I think it's been a very, very good place for microbiology to be. 
Also, everyone wants things fast. Can you believe it? You know, you can say, I have it for you in 15 minutes. They want it in 10. I have it in an hour. They want it in 30. Uh, but um, it is important to turn these things around quickly. Uh, we're trying to get uh, people discharged from seizures, of course, as rapidly as possible as all medical centers. So turnaround time, batching, they don't like batching. They want it in, out, real time. They want it as fast as you can get the result. So those are our challenges. I could go on and on, but you don't want me to go on and on, so I'll go to the next slide. Okay, and so here's the seasonal detection of viral pathogens. I think you all are quite aware of the seasons in which um, certain viruses do appear. And we haven't seen any fluid um, in California yet, and there hasn't been much reported across the country, but time's coming. And so um, we're gearing up for influenza season, of course. So you can see the variation, and maybe you don't need to test all viruses all times of the year. There could be, of course, flexing in your testing. Hey, um, so I thought you might want to know what we're doing. You can laugh and say, oh, I can't believe you're doing this, but that's okay. Uh, this is the, how we use our uh, testing algorithm at CEDARS. Um, we have developed, a, as I said, the multidisciplinary approach. And um, from our emergency department and urgent care, we've not been able to talk them out of doing rapid testing. But what we have been talking, um, talking to them about is they do want to do a, a rapid flu A and B and RSV test um, and have a very rapid turnaround time for emergency care, but they have offered the possibility that once influenza season is upon us um, and they feel that they're comfortable uh, with the, the patients coming in and the symptoms and such, they might back off in the numbers that are ordered. In the pediatric population coming through in our ED, however, they're going to continue to most likely want rapid tests performed. We're always open for new tests. Um, and, w and can move into new tests in the future, but this winter we're going to be using the VD Veritor. Um, the BioFire Respiratory Panel we use for the small population of pediatrics we do have in-house, and we also use this, this panel for the adult intensive care units and transplant patients in our medical center. And then the Veraging Nanosphere Panel has been used successfully for the general medicine units and the adult intensive care units to rule out influenza and to also look for RSV. And if pediatrics are pretty sure they have an influenza or RSV case, we could also use, have used the nanosphere um, for that um, case as well. The problem that we get into at CEDAR sometimes is that they just want a single target. Particularly in um, our ED and our pediatric population, they might want to test for just Bordetella. And that's been an issue for us using these panels, and that's why we have some send-out tests to this day. Also, in, with uh, our transplant population, sometimes they want just adenovirus. So we've been able to um, eliminate some of the send-outs from using these panels because we do not want to do a multiplex panel if only they want one target from the panel. The diagnostic challenge. Of course, the, the most important thing of all is the quality. So we want a quality test choice with good sensitivity and specificity, and the sensitivity of ampli amplification is certainly desired over the less sensitive EIA or DFA, so we never use those methodologies um, within the hospital for diagnosis. We're relying, once a patient is admitted into CEDARS, we're re relying on molecular testing. Of course, there's microbiology bu budget considerations. There's expensive to purchase and reagent rental multiple molecular platforms, so we would like to have um, the fewer and fewer platforms available to us. It's expensive to send out samples to reference labs for single target testing, so we would be, it would be very good if we could have the ability to just produce virtually single target testing from those um, platforms that we have. Also the labor inefficiency of the testing platform. Um, labor has become an issue at CEDARS that sometimes it's very hard to get text and to have adequate people um, in your laboratory, so you want to make sure that you have lean um, kind of uh, situation going. The fewer instruments that people have to be trained on, the better it can be, the, the more competent they can be on fewer instruments, and all of the proficiency testing and IQCP gets to be very challenging and expensive, so the fewer amount of quality control material that you need to buy, uh, the fewer numbers of proficiency test specimens that you need to buy. That all goes into our budget 
and is um, plays into having more of one single platform rather than multiple platforms. Also, I think sometimes in the laboratory, if we don't have sick relatives and such, we forget about what the cost to the patient is. And I think, you know, as the healthcare um, situation comes, has very heavily come upon us over the last few years, I think more and more we're beginning, um, becoming very aware of cost to patient. These multiple target respiratory panels from our medical center are built at a very high rate, and they're very so-called expensive tests. Um, and um, the patients also may not be adequately insured or have no in outpatient type insurance. Um, the, uh, not often do I get billing questions to the laboratory, but on occasion, physicians get so frustrated that they pass the calls on to the laboratory, particularly physicians in their office. And the only calls in the most um, upset calls I've received over the last two years have been bills from multiplex panels that have arrived at their homes and particularly if no diagnosis was made and they were all negative and crying mothers on telephones people just angry with me over how much we dared bill for some of these tests so I think we need to keep this in mind um, what the uh, actual um, uh, billing is to some of these patients so how can flexible testing and flexible pricing then assist some of my dilemmas and issues that I have in my own laboratory? Well, first, it would be very good for ability to adapt to physician ordering patterns. So we only do the initial request, and then if they have, if that doesn't yield what they need, we could do additional testing uh, or a releasing of results of a test that's already been performed. That's kind of a unique concept, kind of mind-blowing for people in the laboratory because we're so used to just responding to phone calls from physicians to go do things or orders coming in and go do something new and add on test. You go add it on and you, you do it and it's added on an extra time and extra money. So the concept of the ability to do a massive amount of um, tests and then only release a certain amount and then only um, release other things if the physician calls back and wants those additional tests released. It's really, a, I think, a, a kind of a, a mind-breaking um, you know, process for us to go through. So um, I think flexible testing is something that could be very, very useful for a lot of laboratories. So you only order, test, and bill those things that are specifically ordered. This would also help with compliance issues where they only order one test and you were doing multiple things that were really not within what they were ordering. Also, I think it would have a potential to send out, uh, to eliminate most of the send out tests. Send out tests can be troublesome in your laboratory. You get tired of futzing around, sending things out. It takes a lot of your tech time to send out tests, plus it's extra um, cost to the institution for send outs. There's also can be a reduced in laboratory costs. You'll have less cost in inventory, maintenance contracts, everything I've been talking about. I know I'm like a broken wind, uh, broken um, record, but costs are very, very important, and we need to control these costs. And so if you're not having multiple instruments, not having to add on, send out, text doing things which are not very lean or efficient, this is really, really important to laboratories these days. And of course, you'll have reduction in turnaround times. Physician will call back and want something added on, you go, oh no, you don't have to wait, just one moment, here it is. That could be mind blowing for a physician, I think, when they're used to saying, you know, saying things like, oh, I'm sorry, sir, but we have to find that specimen, we'll have to send it to the send out lab, that'll be 48 hours before we get a result back. This could really be um, very, very helpful information. So this is the very gene flex panel, and this is uh, basically what um, we're talking about, the, the concept of flexing. This is a 13 viral target in three, with three Bordetella. You can see at the bottom, three Bordetella targets. It's one product, one platform, covering the continuum of multiplex respiratory testing demands. It would also help with your inventory management as this is all the only um, cartridge or test that you would need. Notice that there's lines uh, drawn or going down on that flex panel. Those are the five testing categories. And these um, targets are separated into five areas. And notice that the bottom one is just um, Bordetella. In my situation, this um, type of flex testing, where I would only choose to test the Bordetella, 
that could help me eliminate a major send-out test that I have from my ED and from my pediatric population. So that's the immediate thing that I keyed on, on it. But as you look at this panel and how you could use these five different categories, I think every medical center could envision how this could potentially be useful in their setting. So how does flex ordering and reporting work? I'm not an expert, and I'm sure the people here can um, answer any questions that you might have about this. But basically the concept is you would do your, um, you would get your physician order for say you want board of teletesting. You would test the one panel and the only thing that you would choose on your screen to be released would be the board of tele. And that would be the only test that would be reported and billed to the patient. But then say the physician said, oh, I thought the patient most likely had Bordetella, but you know, this cough could be more para-influenza-like. Can you now test para-influenza? Well, I could just go back in and select that unit to be released, and then the para-influenza targets would be billed to the patient and would be reported. So it's a very unique concept that we've not dealt with previously. So I keep talking about money, and I hate to talk about money because I want to I want to do microbiology. But as I said, this is also important. So if you have flexible pricing, let's just look at um, a, a laboratory. Say this is what their percentage of testing would be for the year. They have 60% that are only ordered by the physician for flu testing, 15% for flu and RSV. Um, the physician wants an entire panel of many many targets. 20% and pertussis is only 5%. So if you look at the scenarios at the bottom and, and the way the, the cost structure works out, if you only had a one-size-fit-all respiratory panel, this would end up costing my institution for 1,000 specimens $130,000. If I did um, a molecular test for flu and then did the one-size-fit-all panel, it would be 85000 if I use the flex panel with the breakdown of the above reporting, it would be at 65000 So you can see there is potential savings to the laboratory as well as to the patient for such type of um, flex testing and um, reporting. So how will we use this flex? Um, you know, you think you're going to use it one way and then as you start using it, things come your way, committees meet, and people change their minds. But right now we think that we'll, um, we are most likely going to use it in this way. Offer, of course, influenza testing only in the adult population if that's all they want. We could also do influenza plus RSV, particularly in our transplants and our, patients, uh, our pediatric patients that we do see once in a while. Adenovirus in our transplant population, that's a separate group that could be reported. The entire panel on some of our um, uh, immune suppressed individuals in our Saperstein um, intensive care units, and then just Bordetella testing on those who are coming through to be screened out for Bordetella. You all might have a totally different idea how this could be used, but this is the way we think we're moving. How could flexible testing be applied to other things such as GI pathogens? Um, the problem with GI testing, of course, is you have uh, a lot of conventional diagnostic tests for bacterial culture, ova, parasite, and antigen detection tests for various things. There's many tests being ordered and not all of them need to be ordered on all patients. A lot of these methods are very labor intensive and it can take many days to produce results. So having an overall type molecular panels uh, to be able to detect these entities could be very, very useful. And of course one of the major um, things you would want to do is separate healthcare associated C. difficile, which usually is tested by itself away from the community acquired agents. The IVSA uh, guidelines for management of diarrheal disease has kind of broken them down into three categories that um, the infectious disease and the laboratory people are supposed to think about testing. And these categories include the community acquired, the nosocomial pathogens, and then those of chronic diarrhea, which are mostly parasitic. So if you had a, a mass panel and you could separate out different things to report, if you had um, a person that had a community acquired um, disease and you only wanted to test and report the bacterial pathogens, you could do so. Um, if you, uh, you could separately test C. difficile or only report C. C. difficile from a flex panel, or you could look for the parasites in the certain populations. 
So I can see that not only for the respiratory pathogens, but also for the GI pathogens, that flex-type testing concept might work very well. So how would flex testing be applied? Well, similar to respiratory testing, symptoms are not always that clear-cut in a diarrheal disease. So physicians will often um, have an all-inclusive order set. I mean, from the time I've been in microbiology, we have had routine culture and O&P. I don't care how long they've been sick. I mean, how many parasites are you going to get in Beverly Hills, you know? But they're going to order everything. I've even had add-on cryptosporidium, not in HIV patients or such, um, and a lot of massive tests, times three, on patients um, that live in Beverly Hills. Maybe that's necessary. Maybe those patients have had unusual circumstances and they need all that testing. Or maybe they just need a routine uh, bacterial uh, culture test with uh, shiga toxin testing. So if you had flex testing, you could do the same thing. You could, um, depending on um, somewhat on the patient's symptoms, using the IDSA guidelines, they could, or you could test one major panel and the physician could order certain tests and you could selectively report what is tested. It's sensitive PCR flex testing uh, could um, certainly encourage this type of targeted testing. And I can tell you from experience from moving into molecular testing for stool cultures, uh, for stool testing, our stool cultures aren't that great. Um, flex, I think molecular testing is a far better way to go for looking for enteric pathogens. And so you're going to have fewer repeat samples and you're going to have a much leaner, cleaner laboratory when you go to molecular testing. And then flex testing can just even add more to the concept of only testing certain targets. It would keep the cost to the lab and to the patient lower and not test or report non-clinically indicated results for the stools just like it would for respiratory things. And with that, I end. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those now. Thank you.